Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Genetics Podcast. I'm really excited to be here today with Dr. Holly P.A., who's a senior research scientist in bioethics and genetic counseling at the Research Triangle Institute, which we're going to learn a little bit about today if you're not familiar with it. It's an independent nonprofit institute that's dedicated to improving the human condition. It's based in North Carolina, which is actually where I grew up. So I have known about RTI for a very long time, but um, we're going to talk about a very innovative new newborn screening program that's being run out of North Carolina and RTI, and also some of Holly's past work um, in return of results and uh, genetics and psychiatric conditions. So Holly, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Of course, I'm glad to be here. I uh, would love maybe if you could give a quick background of uh, what led you to where you are today and uh, how you got into into this world? Oh, okay. That's a long question. Um, all right. Fantastic. Well, as you mentioned, I have a, a background interest in genetic counseling as well as in bioethics. And I also, uh, well, I'll start there. So I have always been very interested in the intersection of genetics and genomics and bioethics and very specifically in how we help people understand, manage, and also make decisions about complex phenotypes or complex outcomes. So um, I'm bringing those things together, when I started with my genetic counseling degree, my area of focus was psychiatry because I was very interested in, in that was quite a while ago, in those days, the um, fairly novel concept that we can help people understand risk in their family. And that's not necessarily through genetic testing. You know, even now there's very little genetic testing done. But when I started my clinical career, there really was almost none unless those very, you know, uncommon 22Q sorts of families. So really helping people understand what it is that causes recurrence in the family and helping them develop some models, some mental models for understanding the potential for recurrence and risk. And a lot of that counseling was around the psychosocial elements of helping people understand, um, helping them manage their concern, their uncertainty, and in many cases, really uh, generations of impact on an entire family because of psychiatric illness. Uh, that work, led me to be more and more interested in research and not just the clinical aspect, but also really starting to develop some understanding of how do we help people who are in these difficult situations of understanding challenging risk information and or making difficult decisions. And from, from that, I really sort of pivoted a big part of my career toward research and in that exact realm of understanding. And in that way, I have sort of two major components of my work even today. One of those is on that idea of uh, making complicated decisions. So I do a lot of work in decision making. And the other component, the other complicated component is the how we ethically bring new technologies into clinical and public health settings. So those are, are, are my two primary focuses. Yeah, I'd love to dive into each of those arms actually. So complex decision making what do we know uh, i have kind of two questions on this first is you mentioned this idea that um there's a number of different aspects in if we if we take uh psychiatric illness for example that runs in families uh we have genetics but what other kinds of factors and maybe you can talk a little bit about complex decision making and and how you fit all of these different risk factors uncertainty what do we know about the you know the the field of complex decision making as it relates to genetics and and more broadly family illnesses that run in families. Yeah. So there are many domains to the way people make decisions around complex disorders. And I'm just going to hit on a few of them because this is a whole um, you know, week long discussion. On the topic. Not a, <laughs> right. Uh, so there See, there's a number of elements that are uh, that are required for people to be able to make a an informed decision about whatever it is, whether it's reproduction, whether it's, you know, do I um, uh, take medication or not? When I'm symptomatic, do I seek help? So they're very kind of basic and core elements. And that really starts with a complex uh, phenotype with 
developing people's own mental model. So making meaning of that risk in the family. And people do that in many different ways. And those ways can be quite adaptive. But some people, um, frequently, people actually hit some walls in there and they either start doing things that are maladaptive for them long term or they get stuck. And that being stuck is often affective. It's because they are are they are afraid, afraid of potential outcomes and are concerned about uh, kind of moving forward with a decision. And I think that's a place where people in genetics and mental health can really make a big difference for people is helping them take their existing understanding, their existing mental model about the illness in their family, layering on some, we don't want to get rid of that. We want to work with that and layering on some additional nuance about what we know about complex phenotypes. So the the genetic and the environmental components. Most people have a pretty good innate understanding that there are these kind of multiple components that are required for a complex phenotype. So usually we can build on people's existing understanding and helping them then take that better understanding of of etiology and apply it to their own situation. And as I mentioned before, that often really comes down to the counseling in genetic counseling. It's helping people become more aware of what their actual primary concerns are and helping them generate a plan to be able to move to the place where they can make the decision that's required in their life. So it's a, a you know a complex process, but it actually can be done in a relatively short encounter. Right, interesting. So if I play that back, it sounds like there's a there's a phase to this which is about almost understanding the core concepts of what what is going into my particular situation. What you were saying is that people are actually remarkably good at at understanding the the facts on the ground, so to speak. But then the more often more challenging part is then how do I apply those into decision making in my unique situation, which can be much broader and more complex and also a lot more subjective, right? You can understand that this is a disease that has both genetic and environmental impacts and and fair enough. And I may understand that, but then how do I use that to make decisions about taking a medication or reproduction or whatever? That's a more often more complicated question. Is that right? Exactly right. Yeah. Thanks. And then and then on the yeah, so what what's changed? I mean, in the past a decade or so as, and then we can get into the adoption of new technologies. Uh, what What's changed about, are we any better as a society of helping people to make these complex decisions or is that just a really tricky problem? Do we, do we still have a lot of work to do there? We definitely do still have a lot of work there. And so part of it is, as you know, our, um, it has taken, I think as a field, it has taken us much longer to understand the nuances of etiology of complex phenotypes, regardless of what they are than, you know, 25, 30 years ago, we ever would have thought. And so some of it is literally our understanding, our ability to generate um, the kind of information we need to understand the cause of a phenotype. And we're moving in the right direction there, certainly, but it is slow. And so, I think a, a way that we're starting to be able to apply more of these genomics understandings to um, clinic and to research is in the polygenic risk score. So we are, and, and some of those risk scores, as you know, are um, becoming quite advanced. They still are not very predictive, but they're starting to bring in things like family history and environmental exposure. So things beyond just the, the polygenic itself to generate a more holistic risk score. So we're moving in a, a positive direction, but it's slow because of the complexity of these phenotypes. So the the inputs into these genetic counseling sessions are, are slowly getting better. Uh, another thing that really has been, I think, quite, um, quite important to the field is developing best practices and models to actually engage with people around complex phenotypes. So how do we help people understand this complexity? How do we help them move toward decision making? And so it's both in research that's being conducted in um, understanding how to do this well, but also things like, you know, how do we develop decision aids for people who are faced with complex decisions? And both those things are, are have been coming together quite well. And I think now um, we really have an arsenal of opportunities to help families really understand their family history and make better choices. 
I, I'd love to talk a little bit about RTI and then the early sure. check program. So for those who aren't yeah. too familiar with RTI, maybe you can explain a little bit about um, what the mission and, and some of the big projects the organization is involved in, and then talk a little bit about the early check program. Um, for context for you and for other listeners, we had an interview with Wendy Chung, who is a PI of the Guardian Project, which is mm-hmm. another big um and I think, you know, very, uh, very exceptional whole genome based newborn screening projects. So we're doing a little bit of a series to dive into this world of newborn screening. And it's an area that I think it's I've been excited about it since I wrote my PhD cover letter about why I was so interested in genetics about the opportunities that newborn screening would bring for prediction and prevention. So I'm super excited about what you all um, what you all are are doing, but yeah, maybe you could start a little bit with the RTI uh, and early check background so people know where you're coming from. Of course. Well, you did an excellent introduction of RTI. It is an independent um, nonprofit research group that is housed in North Carolina, although it's an international organization. RTI was developed as um, initially it's 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 what called the research triangle. So it's a, a little triangle between the large academic institutions in North Carolina. Um, and it was initially developed as an organization that could uh, be a convener and bring together expertise from across the academic institutions in North Carolina, but also be nimble and responsive in a way that large academic institutions are sometimes not able to be. Uh, RTI has grown really considerably. We um, have now over 5,000 employees around the world. And the, as you indicated, the mission is to improve the human condition. So RTI is very applied. We do a translational research. Uh, there is some discovery-based research, but most of the research is translational. Um, RTI is, is really pushing toward the idea of impact for um, people. And we have started a new initiative where we are aiming to be able to generate impact for very large numbers of people around the world. And with that, I'll trans- transfer my um, comments over to Early Check. I'll introduce that. So I think er- Early Check is an excellent example of that kind of impact that RTI is known for. Um, Early Check is a study that started in, we started screening in 2018, so it's it's been around for a while. And Early Check was initially developed as a partnership with our state laboratory of public health in North Carolina, the laboratory that conducts standard state newborn screening, as well as um, at that point when it started, both UNC uh, Chapel Hill and Duke were clinical partners. We don't do clinical care at RTI, so we partner with with, uh, clinical institutions for the clinical care. And our initial goals were for Early Check were to bring on a research study that allowed us to generate data and knowledge that would inform whether new conditions should be part of state newborn screening. Yeah. So we had a very successful pilot where we screened babies for a couple of years from 2018 up until 2023 for just a couple of conditions. We screened for Fragile X. We did, um, when we screened for Fragile X, we did offer families the ability to get premutation results if they wanted them. That was an interesting sub-study. Um, we screened for spinal muscular atrophy until our state took it up as part of state newborn screening. So we were able to transfer that over to the state and for Duchenne muscular dystrophy using CKMM. Um, but about, and when we screened about 27,000 babies, we screened a lot of babies. Wow. Um, and we identified babies with SMA, Fragile X, and Duchenne, and we were able to put those babies into appropriate care pathways and for SMA, um, actually provide them access to the life-saving therapies that are now available for that condition. So it was, it was quite impactful. Um, but the phase that we're in now, uh, we started thinking about this phase about, gosh, probably two years ago at least. And it was becoming very clear to us and to others in the field that the um, the tech- technological innovations were leading us in a different direction for projects like Early Check. And so one of those technological innovations is, of course, genomic sequencing and the ability to do uh, screen hundreds, 
to thousands of conditions with a single dried blood spot. This is newborn screening. So we're taking samples from a newborn. And so, you know, we are, uh, the sample is very precious and we have to be very careful about making sure that we're being um, very good stewards of those precious samples. And the second big driver is the amazing innovations that we've seen over the past, um, well, decade, but really importantly over the past five years or so in developing new therapeutics, and especially therapeutics that need to be um, provided to babies very early in life to have the most impact. So particularly gene and cell-based therapies. And those things coming together have led the field to really push toward some exploratory research to understand whether, when, and how sequencing-based technologies could be integrated into newborn screening. And so that's the phase of early check that, that we're in now. We started screening babies in, at, toward the end of 2023. Um, we offer screening to the whole state through our collaboration with the state laboratory, we don't have to take another sample. We use the existing dry blood spot. And as of um, as of about last week, we had screened uh, almost 1,100 babies. Wow. And we've returned results on more than 800 babies. And so we're, and I, I'm happy to, to tell you more about what, what we're finding and um, what, how we're able to generate impact even very early, having just started screening in um, November of 2023. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you're seeing. And uh, that's just in the last couple of months, you said end of 2023. That's amazing. So you're off yeah. to the races. Exactly. So back, um, Back again to my areas of research interest, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the early check study. So as we talked about, my primary areas of interest are the ethical translation of new technologies and in complex decision making. So I'm going to hit on on both of those and yeah. talking about early check. And of course, early check is not all about me. We have a very we have over 30 people who work extremely hard to make early check work. Um, it is an incredible collaboration currently between the State Laboratory of Public Health and UNC Chapel Hill. Um, but since I'm the lucky person who gets to number one, direct early check, and number two, be on this podcast with you today, I'm going to focus on the things that make me the most um, excited about early check. So back to the idea of um, a statewide program. This is one of the things that differentiates early check from many of the other Pilots. There are only a couple of pilots that are now active, but several that are in um, sort of in planning phases. And because of our collaboration with our state laboratory of public health, we are able to recruit every mother who gives birth to a child in the state. We have the contact information through our collaboration. And so one of the, I think, fascinating questions that we we have examined in the first phase of early check and are now examining again is how do people make complicated decisions about whether they want this information for their children? And I will say it's a complicated decision. I think that there's a, a sort of push in our field where the investigators are so enthusiastic and the teams are so enthusiastic about this technology that it's, of course they should do this. And I will I will really pull back and say, I, that is an empirical question about who, who, for whom is this the right technology? Um, for whom is it not the right technology? And it is very clear to me from our ex our preliminary phases of early check and the, the really significant amount of formative work and community engagement that we've done to prepare for this, that this is not the right decision for everyone. And we can talk a little bit more about why, you know, what data is being generated that, that supports that. But in the area of decision making, we are faced with, we're lucky enough to be faced with the challenge of recruiting and consenting from an entire state. Yeah. And so the way we manage that in early check is we use electronic consent. And that is the only way that people can sign up for the study. And so we've had a really, um, again, we've had a history in our first phase of early check, but in, in this new phase, a very fascinating experience 
trying to, uh, it took a year of um, multidisciplinary team working to generate the kind of education and consent that we feel like is needed so that people can make the right choice for themselves and for their family about whether this is information that, that they want about their baby. To add to the complexity, in addition to, um, we're, we're screening, this is, this is similar, I think, to what you've heard from Guardian in that it's sort of independently research groups have come up with having two different panels that they return. And it's it's um, an interesting thing that we're seeing this across multiple studies and these were independent decision making. Yeah. So we have a, a panel one, which are highly actionable conditions that really look pretty similar to things that are returned in newborn screening. So actionable before age two is, is our criteria. And we have a whole process that we use to you know, to decide whether things are in or out, but we have a, a large panel for for um, panel one. We also have the panel two, and for panel two, people can select whether they want this or not, because these are conditions that are less actionable. They still need to be actionable early, but they're less actionable. So some of them have a treatments that perhaps we have very little evidence about, um, and some of them don't have an approved treatment, but have uh, surveillance that has been proven to reduce impact. And some of them have a very active clinical trial pipeline. And so that's what we would be offering families is access to a clinical trial, which we know not every family wants. And clinical trials are not treatments for individual children. So we allow people to make choice there. And then because we um, wanted to actually test something new, bringing this back to my interest in, in polygenic um, conditions. We're also offering type one diabetes risk score, which is a polygenic uh, uh, complex condition that has multiple genes and environmental factors. So we're offering families, they can select whether they want this or not, a genetic risk score um, indicating future lifetime risk for type one diabetes. So it is a, quite complex decision yeah. that families are faced about their newborn. I was uh, I was particularly fascinated by that choice because uh, I don't know of any other program in the world that's doing it, but I think you've approached it in a really good way. And I my, well, my first question is around what you've learned about drivers of people choosing all three panels, just one and two. Can they choose one and three? I'd be really interested in what you learned about on the complex decision-making side, what what sorts of factors play into people going with maybe the most conservative versus the more, um, uh, you know, potentially riskier option? You may get information that you don't know what to do with or can't do anything with. I would assume a higher risk of false positives probably as well in the latter category. So what are you learning about that? Yeah, we're very early. So I want to take care just to, you know, reinforce that we have we're, we're going to be screening for quite a long time. We're doing a lot of evaluation. We'll have much more nuanced answers to come. But what we're what we found with um, over a thousand signups is that um, most people are selecting all three panels. And I'm looking at, at my screen so I can actually tell you the right thing. So right. Um, uh, almost eighty percent are actually selecting everything. They, they are selecting panel one, panel two, and type one diabetes. We do have a small number of families that have selected just panel one and two and have not selected the type one diabetes. And we also have a small number of families who've selected panel one and type one diabetes. But the large, and, and of course, you know, about um, almost 20% just select panel one. Yeah. So we are seeing that people are not just saying I want everything and moving on, we are seeing some selection, but most people are choosing all three conditions. That makes sense. What what do you, if you could speculate on what that would look like, and this probably wouldn't be uh, scientifically responsible at this stage, but let's say you offered tons of polygenic scores. This is what some people are arguing, right? And, and there are not that many people who are arguing that it's responsible from birth, but there is a world that I that I hope we live in where at some point in your life you get a comprehensive risk score that includes polygenic risk, other kinds of things that you mentioned, family history, more conventional risk factors. Um, but I'm I'm curious if you're if you could take anything from broader population health from this. It, 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 to me, it would say people are really open to the idea of responsible 
early screening, right? But it, you've you've done a good job of carefully calibrating this to be things that can be at least fairly actionable at um, the stage of of a of a child's life. Yeah, that's exactly right. The, this is back, you know, I, I told you I was going to talk about sort of two things, one about complex decision, one, one about ethical application of new technologies. And I think this goes into that idea of ethical application of new technologies. We very carefully selected type one diabetes because for, for two reasons in, in the newborn phase. Um, one is that there is a lot of work that needs to be done on genetic risk scores for all complex conditions, but type one diabetes is further along than many other conditions. So there is just, you know, the, the sort of state of science, but the other one, like you mentioned, that is we, we thought was critically important for selecting an initial, and, and I would say even for the first um, set of conditions that we screen in the newborn period, even under a research protocol, is that type 1 diabetes, if there is an increased genetic risk, there is a next step, which is autoantibody testing. And that autoantibody testing is not expensive. It can be done through primary care providers. We're offering it through our research study, but it can be accessed through primary care. But equally as important, it can actually be accessed through other long-term research studies that are allowing families to enroll their children who've been identified in another way as having an increased genetic risk. So we felt like it was not, um, you know, that it was the right thing to do. It was the ethical approach to give families this information, but make it in some way actionable as a next step. We know, we don't have the data yet, but we know that not every family is going to take that next step. So we also wanted to select a condition that we can provide education about signs to look out for that are in and of themselves useful for surveillance of that child, because it is a very appropriate thing for a family to find out that they have a, a risk for their child of you know 3% lifetime risk for type 1 diabetes and say, okay, I am going to choose not to do any further autoantibody testing or surveillance, yep. but we want those families to be empowered by knowing signs to look for. I was uh, curious whether you have any data on what percentage of families are likely to get an actionable result in each of those categories, say panel one, two, and three, as a, as a, if you don't have the actual data, just a rough percentage of your expectations would be helpful just to understand like how many people go through this whole process and come out the other side with, um, with no actions. And then how many are in one, two, and three, roughly speaking. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, we don't really have the, the full data on this yet, but we did develop the risk scores such that we really want, we provide um, three different categories for families. So one is, are the people who are in the, the lower risk or who are in more closer to population risk. Then we have a um, an increased risk, we're calling increased concern, and we have a higher concern category. And um, the higher concern category is, are, those are going to be about 2% of our early check participants. Um, the middle, with the middle and high concern together, it, we're anticipating about 10% of our early check participants. So we are, um, again, you know, this is where we are in early days of these genetic risk scores, actually one of the most com complex things we as a research team needed to decide is where do we draw those thresholds where we're, you know, it's a continuous variable, a genetic risk score, but we as a team had to decide where are we going to cut so that we provide people back results that are interpretable to them. And, and that was quite challenging. And I would not be surprised if in a year we're going to, we keep continually evaluating our data. It's very much an implementation science project. We continually review, and I would not be surprised if we um, actually change those thresholds as yeah. we pull in more data. Yeah, it makes total sense. And I guess in in categories panel one and two, is it less than 1% of people probably that you would expect to have one of these quite actionable, I guess, findings or or is it low low single digits? That's my what my mm -hmm. gut would tell me, but I don't know if that's right or wrong. Yeah, we actually are finding um, in, in these early days, it's about 2% of the families we sequence who we have a positive result for. We do have G6PD as one of yep. our um, results and, and 
about one in 10 males who are Black or African American will be expected to have that finding. Um, we have had other findings to date. So far, we've had, and I, I, it's again, it's too, we haven't done confirmatory testing for, uh, yeah. for these children. That is our next step is always for, for us to do confirmatory testing. We've only done confirmatory testing for a small handful of children to date. Um, but so far, we have only found one child who had a panel two condition and the rest of them have been panel one, which is not surprising because our panel two is currently quite small at about 30 conditions. And our panel one is much larger at about 180 conditions. Um, and I will say also our panels are going to continue to grow over time. So we expect we'll actually have a higher percentage of positives over time. Yeah, I think this uh, thoughtfulness about the panel two and clinical trials pipeline and, and all of that stuck out to me as well what how how do you think about adding new genes to that panel as time goes on because that's an evolving field and it reminded me of um well you made the point earlier actually about sma and i suspect when you were doing had had the had were there approvals already when you were doing sma testing or was it kind of in the clinical trials period where transit so you're doing something similar on a but on a bigger scale i'm curious of how you think about what um you know what at what stage is the market of clinical trials big enough it's it's probably not one company but maybe it's two or three how do you think about building a scalable newborn screening platform that's linked into clinical trials i think it's so important as well for not just for patients obviously but for companies that are trying to innovate in some of these really hard to reach areas one of the big questions that they have is how am i actually going to find uh people and 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 that where it's still actionable and my drug can do something to help rather than when it's too late. So I think it's uh, figuring out how to link these programs into clinical trials is just so important. So I'd be interested in hearing more about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's a, it's a very interesting um, both challenge and opportunity for studies like early check. Um, as you've indicated, it's has the, the potential to provide two benefits, you know, this, this sort of tie between clinical trials and newborn screening. One of them is we do anticipate and we have, we have, you know, sort of soft evidence that studies like ours do help drive innovation and drug development. We are generating in some respects, sort of generating a market by identifying these children early. Um, the second, of course, is for a family who has a child with a condition that would otherwise be progressive and and devastating for example um you know having the option of a clinical trial can be incredibly important and empowering however we we do need to be really careful because we all know intellectually that the large majority of trials fail and also that even trials that are um, active and do well, the large majority of children or people who are within those trials do not get a benefit. And it is very, um, it, it's sort of seductive on both the clinical and the research side to say, well, look, we're offering families this great opportunity but it's not always a great opportunity. And we know that, especially for rare disease clinical trials, they can be incredibly burdensome for families. Many of the trials that we're most interested in are gene therapies, which come with very significant risks. And we have to be really careful. We have to be good stewards of, um, of the, you know, we have to be careful about the bioethics and be yeah. really, really, thoughtful about how we approach this. So the way our group, does, I'm not saying this is the only right way, the way our group does this is we use a semi-quantitative metric. We have a score, scoring system that was initially developed um, by the UNC Chapel Hill, our UNC Chapel Hill collaborators for an earlier study. We've adapted it for our early check study. And we have a group of um, a multidisciplinary group that includes people with clinical genetics backgrounds, primary care backgrounds, psychologists, um, laboratory staff, and genetic counseling. And we, for each and every one of these conditions, we um, review existing scores. We update if, if they were scored before by this, the Nexus, the NC Nexus project. 
we update the scores, we have discussion about each and every one of them that for panel two, because they're, they're slightly different criteria for panel one and panel two, does end up being quite focused on um, the amount of evidence we have and what types and what uh, what types of clinical trials and how far advanced they are. And so the, the semi-quantitative becomes very important there because it really, there is a lot of, you know, let's contact the expert in this field. Let's contact the industry group. It's very complicated and it's going to change. And so the other thing I should say is there, there's, I think, um, kind of a, a interest in developing a set of conditions that would be returned on newborn screening. A, it's like this is going to be the recommended set for everyone. And that's, I, I think we need to be really careful about that because this field is so dynamic right. that it's going to be really difficult to ever set a set of conditions in place that people should agree to use for any duration of time. Yeah, and then you get some kind of lock in of those conditions and and something that falls just over the line on the edge, then they have to lobby to some enormous national or international body to get it on there, right? So a little bit of yeah. vibrancy where groups like yours can make um, have some independent decision making, I think is a good idea. What are some of the examples of the kinds of genes that would be on panel two, just um, just to get a sense of like, of, of that one or two examples would be really helpful for me? Yeah. Um, so one of the examples that is currently on panel two, and I think this is an interesting one for our group, is actually um, the DMD gene that encodes for dystrophin. This is a gene that is of great interest to our research team. I have a lot of clinical interest and background in Duchenne and neuromuscular conditions. And um, we, as I mentioned before, did a pilot using biochemical testing, a CKMM test for Duchenne and related muscular dystrophies. <clears throat> we, uh, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, we have this interest and have done that work, when we went through the semi-quantitative metric scoring process, it did not score. We did not uh, approve it for panel one. We approved it for panel two because, and this is, I think a good reflection how dynamic things are because we our group collectively did not feel that the evidence of early before two two or earlier treatment was strong enough to put it onto panel one it's actionability before age two so it is currently on panel two it's very likely during the next year, two years that we're going to have new data that's coming out of the ongoing clinical trials and the clinical use of the approved gene therapies, for example, that will change <clears throat> the data we have on actionability and age at actionability, and we might then move it to panel one. Yeah, that's a great example. The And I'll, I'll give you one more piece of nuance about that example. One of the decisions our group made early on as well was that if conditions are part of state newborn screening, they are on our panel one because we did not feel like we as a research group should second guess decisions that have been made um, about like state screening, new yeah. screening. So, <clears throat> excuse me, should Duchenne muscular dystrophy become approved for state newborn screening, it will move to our panel one automatically. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, that's a that's a fine principle. Otherwise, you create potentially a lot more confusion than you're you're helping by lodging a professional disagreement right at the screening program level exactly um you mentioned uh you mentioned a interesting permutation status sub study earlier and i just made a uh made a note to follow up on it because it sounded like that i mean it, it piqued my interest and it sounded like there might have been some interesting findings there maybe you could for those who aren't all that familiar with fragile x maybe you could talk a little bit about Premutation status and what that is, and and anything you learned. I know that was pre early check. That was the kind of precursor program that you ran. But um, I'm interested in it because I think the as as our understanding of genetics has evolved, one of the big things that's evolved is our growing uh, appreciation of incomplete penetrance and in between statuses. Genetics is far from binary and uh, even diseases that we imagined previously were a little bit more binary. And so the, you know, people who are in this category of at significantly elevated risk, but far from 
complete penetrance, I think is going to be a more and more important category over time. So I'm interested in what you learned from that. Absolutely. So before, um, before I, I talk a little bit more about that, I do, I, I think this is a critically important point that you brought up in one of those questions about ethical conduct of, of using sequencing in newborns. I think one of the most challenging and critical things that the field is facing right now, and this is again why research needs to be done, is that variability. So as you know, you know, and most listeners probably know, most of the data we have on rare genetic conditions comes from its clinical ascertainment. We are basing decisions and expectations on data that is biased. Right. We really don't know the full phenotype of many different conditions, and we know that there's going to be reduced penetrance and, and differences in expressivity. And it is really important that studies like early check happen so that we can test, <clears throat> test implementation models. We can figure out how to consent people appropriately, but also so we can really start to understand the true population phenotype. Yeah. And that's going to require long term studies, unfortunately, but it's also going to require collaboration and data sharing from the studies that exist now. It's a really, really complicated problem. Yeah. Okay, so Fragile X is a good example. Um, a very simple example compared to the phenotypes, the heterogeneity we're going to see in some of these other conditions. But fragile X is a disorder caused by a trinucleotide tri expansion. And there is, um, for a long time, the people who were termed carriers um, have been documented to have some mild and sometimes not so mild manifestations that are quite similar to Fragile X, as well as some things that happen later in life that are quite different than Fragile X. And those manifestations um, have led to a designation that is called premutation status. And the challenge of premutation status is that there's an enormous amount of uncertainty if we have identified children with, with trinucleotide repeats in that in that um, range, what the actual impact on children will be. So we were interested in early checking you know, if we're obtaining the if we're doing the laboratory screening for fragile X, we we know we get the result back. It's our research team knows children are in, in premutation range. And so we felt like it was an interesting research study and um, something that we could under a very controlled situation where we have genetic counselors, we have psychologists, we have uh, clinicians who can follow children to offer that information for families who want it. And the way we managed that was we did a second consent. So we did the, the primary early check consent very, uh, actually right away when people consented, sent them a second consent and asked them if they wanted to know the premutation information. And that experience beyond teaching us a lot about how we help families manage uncertainty, how we talk to them when we anticipate a very mild phenotype, how we sort of help them manage things like screening results that are largely informative for later risks and risk in the family. It allowed us to develop some approaches and internal protocols that we were able to now bring into this world of sequencing where things are even more complicated. Yeah, that makes total sense. I was curious in the the future of uh, early check, and this will probably be my last question because we're running up against time. But okay. um, I can see a I can see a future where you all are always uh, leading the the state level or national level programs by quite a few iterations because you have a more controlled environment where you can introduce some slightly more innovative technologies, learn some of these lessons, and then ultimately inform the broader policy. So I'm 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 wondering A, if that's if that's the plan, at least for the time being, you can kind of operate this earlier pioneering track that hopefully leads the state and national scale. Um, and I'm also interested in what other kinds of technologies you're thinking about. There's, I suppose, a restriction 
within the blood spot. I'm, I'm, I didn't know you could actually get enough mm-hmm. DNA to do whole genomes. It's, uh, it's amazing that you can, but you, you can't do everything that you might want on a proteomics, metabolomics, uh, everything wish list. So how do you think about that constraint and then what new technologies you can or can't bring to the table? That's a, a really great question. So, um, Practically, yes, the the sample is a limitation and there are things, there are very practical things we've talked about with our state, such as, you know, can we eventually collectively move toward a card that has more spots on it? So there are practical potential solutions for things like that, but they um, require policy level change for the state. So, you know, it's a longer term solution that we're working toward. But there are things um, that we would like to be able to do that we have limitations in access to samples. So for example, we're quite interested in the chromosome 15 disorders for which we would need to do methylation testing. And for most of our children that we've, you know, that we screen through early check, there is not sufficient blood sample to do the sequencing based testing and the methylation based testing. And so we have to, as a research group, really think carefully about how do we sequence our work? How do we work within existing blood spots when and how do we think about obtaining new samples from from families, which is possible, but quite challenging. And it would change the 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 feel of our study because we would no longer be statewide, right? That would require us to do a different approach. That would be quite um, hospital based approach. Um, So there are definitely practical limitations and there are certainly sample based limitations, but I want to go back um, to one of the things you started with, which is thinking of longer term. So it's not, I think the most important thing for us and for studies like ours is not really to be so focused on the practical that that's critically important, but to think like you said about where do we need the data and how might this look in the future? And if, if our goal is only to get these large panels in state newborn screening, we need different types of data than what our goal is, which is to say, maybe that's the right place. And we're going to get the data and develop the supports to see if that's the right place. But maybe it's not. Maybe yeah. the right place long term is a standalone, voluntary, second tier kind of newborn screening. And yeah, if that's a model that we find acceptable and appropriate, which we do, we think that's probably the best model, at least for the short term, the types of approaches we develop and the data we collect needs to correspond to that aim. Yeah, that makes sense. So a standalone program would, I guess, then free you up to collect different kinds of samples and and have a little bit more, remove that constraint, basically, and uh, obviate that question entirely. We don't have to stay within the bounds of a blood spot. Well, and I think even more important, it uh, addresses the fact that there is still so much we don't know about these conditions and so much we don't know about how to best implement large panels in state newborn screening and we might get there but this intermediate step i think does need to be something that we all take into serious consideration this may be the most ethical next application that allows widespread access to sequencing yeah, and that makes sense well i just would like to say thank you this was an amazing discussion um and thank you for spending so much of your time and the team's time putting this together you're uh You've been thinking about this and doing work for a really long time. And I think it's amazing. And I, I'm excited personally and professionally, I guess, to see the uh, fruits of um, all this hard work you've been doing. There's a big program in the UK with Genomics England. There's Guardian that we uh, spoke to that Wendy's leading. And it's really exciting to see not just one, but three major programs, at least that I'm aware of, and many, many more uh, popping up around the world that are doing some incredible work. So I'm very optimistic uh, and and you're, you're doing it in such a thoughtful way. So thank you for taking the time to explain it. Of course, it's been a pleasure. Great. And as always, thanks everyone for taking your time to listen to us. If you enjoyed the episode, please just share it with a friend uh, who you think would like it or leave us a review on your favorite podcast player. Thank you. And we'll see you next time.